this is CapCan Knows, the official podcast of the Capital Area College Access Network. We're excited to engage the community in conversations about college access. I'm your host, Diana Yafizova, an AmeriCorps VISTA serving with CapCan. Joining me is CapCan's College Access and Engagement Associate, Jonathan Rosewood, and our guest, Dr. Marcus Coleman, a professor of practice at Tulane University with a joint appoint appointment in the Department of Economics and the Strategy Leadership and Analytics minor. Dr. Coleman is an experienced educator whose study is defined by a mixture of agriculture, food systems, and student engagement roles. So let's get started. First of all, Dr. Coleman, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm so excited to be here with both of you today. Deanna, it's a pleasure to meet you. Jonathan Rosewood is somebody that I've known for probably 20 years since he was uh, an infant undergraduate <laughs> student in college. And so I'm very excited to be here with you and to speak to both of you today. Doc, what's up, man? I love you, man. How you doing, man, bro? Man, I'm just out here, man, trying to live the dream in this agriculture and food system world, man. We are just working hard. I love it. I love it. I see you guys. Hey, let's get this thing started, bro, because I know we got a lot of things to talk about, and I know you want to get to class because I know you got to go teach in a minute, so I'm just happy to have you on. But for every podcast that we do, man, we begin with a personal story of who encouraged you to continue your education beyond high school. And then why is it important uh, to you? Uh, 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 and if you could tell us about that. Yeah, man, I come from a household of people that had college degrees. And so I was raised by my grandmother and and, and she was a school teacher and um, she really pushed all of her four kids to go on to college and all of her four kids had college degrees. And so coming out of that household, it really wasn't an option for me. Um, but even past undergrad, like that journey to go on, for me, it was all about finding mentors and the right mentors. And I've been blessed over the, my career, you know, as a, as, a, as a youngster and throughout my career, just to have some good mentors to push to push me along and, and provide a positive example. Um, one of the best mentors that, I, that I've had is, is somebody that I still keep in contact is actually there at Michigan State University. Uh, Vice Provost Dave Weatherspoon was my Yay! academic advisor there. And so, yes. yeah. And so he and I, um, I just talked to them last week, uh, but he he and I keep in contact whenever I make, you know, professional decisions, even decisions about school, where I was going to go to school, you know, he was somebody that that I would bounce ideas off. And so just a mixture of family, um, having, you know, family examples, but also having and bringing in and being good enough to bring in, you know, some quality mentors to help guide that and, 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 and exhibit what that path looks like to, to, to continue education. But, you know, not only in continuing education, but just to, so, just to show the doors that open up to you with continued education, particularly in the agricultural field. I think like before we started filming this podcast and before like this month, I was seeing that, you know, I could do all the marketing for agriculture month. And for me, like agriculture, like when I thought of it, I thought of like farmers, you know? Yeah, and me too. Been, <laughs> like when I was, you know, I grew up in a city, a really big city, there was not no farms or anything around so I think a lot of young people can feel the same way you know they have a very diminished view of agriculture and from your experience as an educator and someone who's in the field can you give us an overview of agriculture you know as like what do you really study and like what kind of careers are there past you That's know good. the very obvious of being a farmer I mean it's it's natural for for folks to think about the, the first thing that people think about agriculture is 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 plow sows and cows whether that's growing food out of the ground, whether that's dealing with cattle. But the thing that I always try to tell people to remember about, uh, about agriculture, and you, even as I teach food system classes now, agriculture is around us in our daily lives. The house that you live in has connections to the agriculture industry with forestry. Um, every bite of the food that you eat um, has connections to every aspect of the agriculture, agriculture and the food system. Um, and so, you know, if you think about, uh, and, and this is how I describe agriculture now as I've sort of transitioned away from really working with production agriculture, I talk about it in the context of agriculture and the food system. Um, from an academic perspective, agriculture and the food system are the same thing, but as I'm talking to community, talking, talking to communities, talking to youth, I describe them in two separate areas. And so I look at agriculture, I break agriculture and the food system down in four different components. And so when we talk about agriculture, um, I look at that as the process of growing food. And so that's sort of the traditional way that people think about agriculture. You know, there's tractors, there's things in the ground, there's dirt, there's water involved. 
Um, and, and, and that's certainly an important component of it. And even before that, you know, there's opportunities in the input supply sector. So just like each of us go to the grocery store and buy our food, uh, farmers, the people who are responsible for growing our, our food are also consumers. And so they go into different areas to buy things to support their farm. And so they have to buy seeds and they have to buy equipment uh, and all of the things that are necessary to grow our food. And so that's sort of the first component of the food system, agriculture, and the food system that, that I look at is growing food. But there are also three other uh, very important components that, that people will look at as a part of their connection with food, but don't consider, maybe maybe not consider them a part of agriculture. And so that's the, the transforming food, transporting food, and selling food. And so we'll look at this sort of backwards from, from a backwards perspective. And so selling food, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to restaurants, when you go to fast food restaurants, that is a part of agriculture. That's the part of agriculture where most of us people or consumers have access to agriculture. And that's the part of agriculture that we're most familiar with. And so while people tend to think, you know, their first thought about agriculture is tractors and things like that, you, you interact with agriculture on a daily or weekly basis when you go to grocery stores, when you go to restaurants, or however you get by or access your food, that's you engaging with agriculture. And then even before that, the process of getting the food from the farms to us at our households, the distribution system is a part of agriculture. And then the other part, the third part of that that people don't consider is the part about transforming food. And so uh, much of the food that many of us consume, whether that's at a grocery store, at a restaurant, doesn't come straight from a farm gate. It's gone through some further processing. And so actually one of the largest outside of the retail sector, the grocery stores and the restaurants that we just described, you know, the second largest component of, of agriculture is uh, 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 commodity processes and food manufacturers where we take those agricultural commodities uh, those 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 things that are grown on the farm and we transform them to something that's more useful. And I'll give a quick mm -hmm. example. If, if all of us know bread, know cakes, know these things like that, right? If I was to grow some wheat and to give either one of you some wheat, you wouldn't know what to do with that wheat. You probably could do well, nothing with simply with wheat, right? But no. what you can do something with is flour, right? Yeah. And so there's a component of agriculture in the food system that takes that wheat transforms it into something that's more usable flour that you can go in and make cakes and even if you would if some of us don't know how we're around the kitchen and can't do anything with that flour but you can go to the grocery store and buy bread that's already prepared you can buy cakes and all of these things so all of that that stuff that goes into to agriculture it goes into getting you your food is a part of agriculture and that's the thing that i think that uh, that I want most people to know is that, you know, there's jobs, there's opportunities um, that are involved in all sorts of aspects of it. I mean, policy, I mean, people, people with agriculture degrees go to law school, people with agriculture degrees go on to teach high school and go on to teach college, um, environmental stuff. And so there's just a plethora of, of opportunities that are available within the agriculture and the food system that many people don't associate with agriculture and the food system. And that's what's up, Doc. I know I love to eat, man. If you can't, man, tell, me too, man, bro. I'll be eating like a bug, but I'm learning now, you know, uh, how to make sure that I'm eating healthy with it, though. Sure. You know, uh, I mean, I mean, the, uh, you talked about Dr. Weatherspoon. I love Dr. Lorraine Weatherspoon. I remember she's always have us reading like the back of the packages of food to make sure that we were getting the right stuff and be healthy. And I remember that as a young man, uh, high school. And yep. you talked about, you know, young people and all of those good things. And I remember I got to come up and learn about agriculture uh, in high school. What was that? Ninth grade? And just kind of got into it from MSU and them having the program. Uh, what are some things that you probably would talk to young people about, about like getting into agriculture and maybe what are some programs that's out there for them to learn about it and break down the stereotypes that we might have? Sure. One of the, and my, my, I grew up in a rural community, so I was surrounded by agriculture every day, mm -hmm. but that's not the story for everyone. One of the organizations that I did get involved with that did, did get involved with that, you know, is accessible to most people is the 4-H program. Oh, um, and so 4-H is something that it's available in some way, shape or form in every state. Um, they have a variety of programs. Now, most people look at 4-H as a, um, as an agricultural sort of organizational program, 
but it's actually a little bit broader than that. There's a youth development component to it, to leadership development, just other life skills that were part of that. Um, but certainly access to agriculture is, 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 is a part of the educational component. The other part is that there are a bunch of nonprofit based organizations now in the cities and, and other um, uh, community organizations that seek to introduce people to agriculture. And, I'll, and so Deanna mentioned earlier about, you know, she grew up in the city, grew up in Orlando uh, and, and didn't have farms around, which technically isn't true. Um, urban agriculture and the, 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 the growth of urban agriculture around the country has brought agriculture back to cities. And so if you look at the mm -hmm. close to you guys, like in Detroit, um, Detroit is one of the largest cities in the country for urban agriculture. And it's actually, I mean, most people in the Detroit food scene will say that Detroit is the, in the birthplace of urban agriculture where, you know, you have, you don't have to have like a large plot of land, like thousands of acres of land to grow food on. I mean, whether it's a garden in your backyard or whether you're growing on a lot that a house used to be and you're transforming it to a farm, you know, these sort of things are popping up in cities around the country and associated with that, you know, people are doing youth development uh, and introducing people to food. Um, there's also a large movement. I was at a school a few weeks ago here in New Orleans where um, the Edible Schoolyard Project, uh, which was sort of a twofold project at this K through eight school um, in the city. Um, but they were teaching students not only how to grow their food, but once that food is grown, how to prepare that food. And so those wow. are very important life wow. skills that, um, that you know, programs like that that we see in schools around, the, we're starting to see pop up in schools around the country important to to introduce students to agriculture but it's not just about agriculture it's important life skills and taking ownership of, of the things that you eat and, and just showing uh, students how to do those things but for me that introduction outside of just growing up in a rural community being surrounded around uh, being surrounded by farms uh, was the 4-H program which Michigan does have a 4-H program associated with Michigan State University so, yeah, we definitely make sure that people get that information about the 4-H program, because I do remember seeing that, uh, particularly when I start when I graduated from MSU, I saw 4-H starting to come in and help out with the different students that I had. And then I think, man, um, how do you feel? And I, I know you had another question, but I, I wanted to tap in with the, the young people. So you had an opportunity to work with people at MSU. And uh, do you see other programs on college campuses kind of like the uh, uh, minorities in agriculture, natural resources, or, uh, or, or, or MAPS, the Multicultural Apprenticeship Program. Do you see any of those things? Yeah, sure. Uh, at, at the land-grant institutions around the country, so schools like Michigan State or the University of Illinois or the University of Minnesota, these very large schools that were founded based uh, with an agricultural component to them, many of them have um, agriculture-based programs, whether it's summer programs. John Rose, I know that you participated in the summer program at MSU that you got introduced to agriculture, just designed to, to give people introductions to the possibilities. Um, you mentioned the Manners Organization, which stands for Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences, That's which a is a, name. it's a long name, man. That's why we just call it Manners. <laughs> um, you know, that organization was actually founded at Michigan State back in 1984, and it's still growing strong today. Uh, but that uh, that organization, and it's one that I've been a part of for about 20 years now, um, has been very important in introducing, once students get into agriculture or just looking for opportun different opportunities, have just, has been really important, been really good at introducing students to the variety of different opportunities that are available in agriculture. And, and that organization was started by an undergraduate student at Michigan State in agriculture, Dave Weatherspoon, who's still, who's still a professor that we talked about at, at MSU today. Uh, but it allows, and so we talk about, you know, agriculture is being, uh, at least the perception is that it's a field that's, you know, you know, pretty historically white dominated. Um, but when you go to an organization like Manus, while, you know, if you're a student at College X and, and it may only be a handful of, of minority students in agricultural programs, um, when you look at an organization like Manners and being a part of that national conference, it brings you around thousands of people that look like us um, to just show that, you know, you're sort of not on that island, but it provides you opportunities, uh, employment opportunities, internship opportunities. When I was an undergraduate student, I had an internship every summer. I was actually interning in Washington, D.C., um, doing international trade work, which is a part of agriculture. 
Um, so there are a number of, I mean, for students that are looking at agriculture, looking at something that's agriculture adjacent, uh, many of these schools have those summer-based programs that you can participate in and be a part of um, that, that really seek to um, introduce you to all of the possibilities of majoring in something like agriculture or food systems. I think like for me, when I was in high school, like because, I mean, I'm not sure because I wasn't really trying to be in agriculture that much. But I was part of Future Farmers of America. FFA. FFA. Yeah, because, and I think because I was part of the vet technician program, mm -hmm. magnet program in my high school. So it was kind of ingrained in the program. But I think like a lot of times, like when students don't really, might not have transportation to these type of things that you were mentioning or money, because some, some of them do cost money. I yes. think like Future Farmers of America is like a good way to get started in your high school, you know, directly in your high school. And I know a Go lot ahead. of places in Michigan, they have very big chapters. Mm -hmm. I know my school didn't really have a big chapter, but um, I think that's like something that a lot of people who want to get in agriculture could be a really good first step. No, FFA is, is a big part of that. And it's been a longstanding organization. Um, you also mentioned that you you sort of like a pre sort of a pre vet kind of kind of thing. Yeah. Um, most people don't like if 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 you're interested in animals or have an interest in animals or animal science or going to vet school. That's typically associated with agriculture, right? Um, the other part that you that, that's interesting. You so you mentioned FFA, and so we talked about the Manners organization. There is now a Junior Manners, and there are a few Junior Manners chapters throughout the state of Michigan where the Michigan State University chapter of Manners is working with high schools to introduce students to junior Manners. And so that is a possibility as well, in addition to FFA and other programs. Nice, nice. The question, because it comes to, you know, we talked about how agriculture was a predominantly white, uh, to, from the eyes that we see, predominantly white uh, uh, area of field of work. Um, but it's crazy, man. I just took, uh, we talked about turning point earlier, man. We just went to the African-American history museum last week. Right. And I took Nadia there last month and, you know, it's crazy to think back. Like if you think about where we come from, uh, me, uh, Africa, right. How they agriculture was huge where they were. Right. And then when you think about when they came on over here to slavery, even though we were slaves, but agriculture was still huge now can you can do you think man doc that might play a huge role in why we kind of got away from that agriculture uh uh lifestyle and just kind of went maybe in the auto auto mechanic way or a different type of ways or what you think what's your hypothesis there's a number of things that have led to many misperceptions related to agriculture i just uh moderated a black history month panel about a month ago related to black history in the food system and one of the things that we talked about is that there is no American food system without minorities, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at much of sort of the food system that is built in this, this, the southeastern part of the country and, the, and, and even the culture that is responsible for migrating north, much of that was built on the blacks of, of, of black people, right? Um, and much of the, the food cultures and the food that was grown was built on, on those cultures. Now, there are uh, many sort of negative associations that have been historically told. I mean, we, we all know for me with the history of slavery and how much slavery was um, centered in the southeastern part of the country. And then even with the, with slavery, you know, much of much of that, in, that that was centered around different plantations and sort of the plantations were built around various agricultural commodities, whether that was cotton or sugar cane or whatever the case may be, but sort of Black people provided that base and that foundation. And, and from that, that even we, we get a variety of different food cultures that were you know brought over um, to this land. And even if we look at uh, sort of the foundation of the agriculture and, and the work that happens in agriculture now, uh, we look at migrant labor that comes from Central America that happens across this country. And if you look at uh, the, the majority of who does, you know, the major a, a good portion of the food that's producing produced in this country comes from California and Florida. And if you think about who's actually doing the labor um, with that, um, you know, it's, it's it's not representative of a majority white culture. And so um, minorities, particularly black black people and Hispanics, have sort of 
um, foundational pieces that are related to the food system. Um, yes, there are negative sort of aspects that have been historically associated with it. But there are also positive sides of that that we see as well, like food cultures, the types of food that are grown, the types of things that we're eating. And so, so you know, if we look at sort of those positive associations, the types of food that we eat, um, they provide us an opportunity to think a little bit differently about the food system. Um, unfortunately, our educational system typically doesn't do that. Much of the education that um, our minority students are getting related to agriculture relates to the role of, of slavery in agriculture during Black History Month, right? Um, and there's certainly larger aspects to that that we can educate people on. But there are a variety of different opportunities that are there. Um, if you think about um, the new and, be new and beginning farmers and, and people who are re-engaging in agriculture in, in, in many parts of the country, uh, black people, um, young black people are getting back in agriculture. Um, new and beginning farmers are, begin are starting to become largely dominated by women um, getting into the field, yeah. uh, whether that's urban agriculture. Um, and, and a lot of that is opportunities there. I mean, nationally, you know, the average demographic of an Amer what, what we would consider an American farmer is like a 60-year-old white male, right? And so that, that, that sort of thing is dying off, which is leading to opportunities for, for people to get into agriculture, to grow food, to build food businesses. And so when you think about entrepreneurship, uh, you can be an entrepreneur um, in, in agriculture, in the food system, and those opportunities are growing. There's financial support to do those things. And so, um, yes, there's negative associations with that. Um, yes, um, more recent history, you know, due to a number of factors, agriculture has become a field that's been dominated by white people. But we, we're starting to see trends and changing uh, with opportunities being presented for everybody to be involved in the sector. Thanks, Doc, man. I appreciate it, bro. You know, I think that, like, when I talk to a lot of people of minority, you know, especially because I went to MSU, mm -hmm. MSU was a, you know, primarily a white institution. Mm -hmm. And even like, um, like when I would talk to people in my major, you know, that were minorities of people of color, you know, they were just maybe I would have one or two in my class. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously I studied English, which is like, you know, also primarily like a white uh, field. Um, but I think like you went, you had a experience being an educator in both a primarily white institution and an HBCU institution. Oh, sure. yeah. Can you like maybe elaborate on differences a black student may want to study agriculture in HBCU versus a uh, you know, a white institution? And like, what do you really think? Is there any benefits of studying at an HBCU when it's a primarily like a quote unquote, like a white career field? Oh, sure. I can give you that from a student perspective and a, and a professor perspective. Um, and, you know, I went to undergrad at, at a historically black college and I majored in agriculture. And I went, I mean, we had relatively small class sizes, but I went from, you know, having a classroom full of black people Right. Um, all of which, you know, come from many areas in rural Louisiana. And so there was an understanding of agriculture there. So I was in an environment where, you know, we had a lot of students that understood agriculture because they grew up around agriculture. I mean, we had a few folks from the city um, that understood the opportunities in agriculture. Um, but there are certain benefits that because you get those cultural experiences and you get the opportunity to to learn from people that look like you and they could share your experience. Right. And so I went to undergrad there, and then I went to grad school at MSU. I went from being in a classroom full of, of Black students to now being in grad school in a classroom full of 20 or so students where I'm the only Black student. And so wow. that, that experience, you know, can be a little bit different. I mean, people have a little bit different, you know, sort of lived experiences. I think the thing that helped me is that I'm open to, to learning, and I don't, you know, I can kind of fit into my own spaces. And, and like people say, I was able to keep the main thing, the main thing and, and understanding that, <laughs> you know, I wasn't trying to stay in that arena uh, in, that, in that particular situation forever, but I understood the larger goal and I understood sort of the larger impact that I can have by staying in the field and being representative of a race that sort of, you know, for what it's worth, you know, sort of fades out of the field of agriculture and being that representation. You know, you flip that experience now um, from that time, you know, being at an HBCU, being in a classroom full of black people to now 
you know, to then going to MSU, being the only black student in the classroom, you flip that now, 20 years later, now I'm at a, I'm a professor at one of the top 40 schools in the country, a predominantly white institution, one of a handful of, and, 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 and I teach food systems based courses there to now I'm the professor standing in front of the room in a classroom full of white people. And wow. so now, as I'm talking about agriculture and the food system, I'm able to sort of shift away from more of those textbooks, textbook experiences that may not have the cultural aspect of it. So now I'm the one that's, that's disseminating the knowledge and teaching the students about what's real and in, in, in my experiences and sharing, um, you know, other experiences with students. And I'll give you a quick example of why this why this, this perspective is, is important. Um, you know, I teach a class related to food insecurity. Uh, food insecurity, lack of access to food for a variety of reasons is something that many minority communities struggle with. Whether you live in an inner city, whether you live in rural communities, food insecurity is something that many communities and not just minority communities deal with. Yes. I happen to, to teach a population of students of many of which have not come from those situations. And so their perspective of people, their perspective of food insecurity um, is, is, is based upon sort of their lived experiences and, and, and what they've been told in their, from their limited perspective. And so, you know, now I'm able to sort of flip those conversations and show them the human aspect of it and show them sort of a variety of reasons why people find themselves in the situations that they find themselves in. You know, I just so happen to come from, you know, a community, a rural community now that, you know, doesn't have a grocery store in it that, you know, people have to drive 45 minutes or an hour to go to a super Walmart just to have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, right? My students have never seen, many of my students have never seen it. Many of my students have never sort of had those experiences. And so it's important to have that level of representation of the classroom because you can change people's perspective about the realities of different situations um, versus other folks that have not had those realities of those situations. But also being the only black student in the classroom is sort of guided my perspective now that even though I'm the professor, I'm still in many cases, the only black person in the room. So I know how to best deal with those situations. Um, as well. And so it's important to have representation. And so agriculture, uh, because it's something that I'm interested in, interested in, it's something that I have a background in, I'm able to fully give people a, a fuller picture, a fuller perspective about what, what actually happens and what opportunities are there. This is it right on the head for me. I'm, I'm not in agriculture anymore, but um, I am in classrooms now and just trying to help people, you know, get to college or get to a career. And uh, my supervisor, she's not, she, she not on this right now, but she kind of has pushed me into different arenas where I felt like school helped me with that, just like you, right? But now I know how to make sure to put, make sure that what you say, you said uh, 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 can fit into the space. I know how to fit into the space now and be able to still share my story, listen to my students' stories, and then trying to figure out, okay, boom, this is where we need to go, you know, in order to be better and get better sure. and know better and, and reach out. So, man, you hit it right on the head for me. I'm going to keep going because I no, man. I mean, you think about no matter what professional arena you're in, whether it's yeah. agriculture, some of the field. I mean, you're not always going to be in a room with full of people that look like you. You're not yeah. always going to be in a room that you feel comfortable. You're not always going to be in a room that you design. Right. And so you still have to operate in those contexts. And so how do you best operate in those contexts? You prepare yourself to operate there. And so wow. the question was like, you know, being all, you know, the difference between going to an HBCU and going to a PWI and, and you know, making a transition to a PWI being an only agriculture, you know, the black student in an agricultural space, there's a lot of things that you can learn about yourself and how you interact in those settings that can translate to the professional environment, you know, without me transitioning from, as a student, transitioning from an HBCU to MSU and being in that setting, I may not know how to operate now as the professor at Tulane, right? And so it, it's those learning experiences that we put ourselves in, it, it's, you know, it's just like going to the gym and lifting weights. I mean, you're going, when you're lifting weights, you're tearing down muscle, you're putting your muscles in an uncomfortable position that tears them down, but it builds them back up and makes them stronger. Yeah. And so the situations that we put ourselves in, whether it's professional, whether it's our social settings, 
we put ourselves in situations to help us grow and to be better when we actually present it with opportunities to do those things. Man, I love that, bro. And I know we coming to an end, but I just wanted to tap in because you kind of, we didn't hit on mentorship today, but you saw, you talked about a mentor that you had once you came here, right? And you talked about a community that you kind of got into. So can you briefly just kind of talk about how that mentor and then the community such as a Vanners or something that you got involved in where you were here uh, kind of helped you stay the course and then maybe something that you can tell young people or people that's trying to go back into school or the workforce, like how those two come to hand to hand. Right. And, and, and finding that community and finding that mentor can mean a number of different things. It doesn't always have to be in that space. So when I made the decision to come to MSU as a grad student, I gave this advice to a student a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my decision to come to Michigan State wasn't fully about Michigan State, right? One of the things that when I did a visit there, like I knew Michigan State was going to be what it was. I knew that I was going to end up working with who I was working with, but there's more to life to me than academics. And so one of the things that I wanted to know was that you know, the things that I enjoy outside of that space, if I was going to be able to do on the network within the school, but I found that network outside of that. And that's no different than you going anywhere. Um, but, you know, and, and I teach a, I teach a leadership class and we talk about strengths and weaknesses uh, and understanding in, whether you're in high school or whatever that is, understanding what your strengths and weaknesses are is a continuous process. But understanding your strengths and weaknesses, particularly your weaknesses, helps you to understand what you need to work on. You have to be very honest with yourself about what those things are. And so if you can understand your weakness, you can work to make those weaknesses your strengths. And so that's building a team of people around you. If let's say you want to be the president of the United States, right? That one of the best ways, you know, you know, in theory, the best yeah, ways to become the president of the United States is to build a team of people around you that can help to get you to that point, right? We'll build that team, um, yeah. Build that team of people. And so that's that's what mentoring is, um, reaching out to people. If you know that you want to be a professor and you've never sat down and had a conversation with a professor, you need to sit down and have a conversation with a bunch of different professors. If you want to be, um, um, you know, the, the GM of General Motors, right? the, the CEO of General Motors, you need to start talking to people in leadership at General Motors to help get you there, right? right. And so that's that's an uncomfortable thing for a lot of people, particularly if you're not a social person. Yeah. Um, I I do a number of exercises in my classes now where I, I force students to go out and have networking conversations. Uh, but those are things that you know that you need to begin in high school, uh, whether that's you know participating with this organization, whether you participate yeah. with organiz organization organization like the Training Board of Lansing, whatever that is. Um, finding people who can help to get you where it is you want to go. That process sometimes requires us to leave people behind too, which Ooh. is a difficult part of that process. Ooh. That's a whole nother conversation. Ooh. <laughs> whole nother conversation. It's real. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, it seems like we are coming to an end of the interview. And uh, I got one last question for you. I hope you're uh -oh. at time with, in our account. Uh, uh, our, our, uh, uh, <laughs> we end every interview with uh, hashtag cap can knows. Okay. So where you would state your name and what you know. So my name is Dr. Marcus Coleman, and I know that there are a variety of different opportunities for students that want to be engaged in agriculture and the food system to go into those opportunities. Uh, but it requires us to learn about what agriculture and the food system actually is. It requires us to go out and find those mentors to help us get there and achieve our goals. And so with people like you two available to help students, I think that's possible. This is all the time we have for today, and I want to thank Dr. Coleman for coming on the podcast to chat with CapCan. Appreciate it, man. I, I really appreciate sitting down with you two talking. I appreciate the opportunity, and I just appreciate the opportunity to, to hopefully be able to help some youth make some good decisions in life. Thank you. For information on CapCan, please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. The links will be in the video description below, or visit our website, CapCan.org. Thank you for all for listening to us today, and we will see you again soon. Thank you.